Okay, we left the last video talking about contractility and still needing to go over preload and afterload. So let's talk about preload. Preload being the LV wall tension at the end of diastole. Um, makes more sense to think about this in terms of something that we can physically measure easily, which would be the left ventricular end diastolic pressure or the left ventricular end diastolic volume. This preload is highly dependent on the return of your venous blood to your heart. To put this into perspective, only about 15% of your blood is in your arterial system at any given point in time, but about 64% of the blood is in the venous system. That means that your um, venous system is acting as a very large reservoir for blood. With an anesthetic, you might get a large drop in your preload, basically because the blood is hiding in this large venous reservoir. Veins have a smooth muscle layer, which people seem to forget about, but this is very important for controlling your preload. The tone of this smooth muscle in the veins is controlled by your sympathetic nervous system, and the normal state for them to be in is somewhat contracted. The drop in blood pressure that you get with a spinal anesthetic is a very good example of the decreased preload from venodilation. The tone of the veins is controlled by your sympathetic nerves, and if we block this with a spinal anesthetic, then we will change the diameter of our veins to be maximally dilated, therefore your CVP goes down and the blood return to your heart will decrease. Ultimately, that means you have less filling of your heart during diastole, so your preload is worse. This drawing here represents the tone or the resting tone of your venous capacitance beds. And they're being squeezed because you have sympathetic tone here. And then if you were to give someone a spinal or a uh, induction of a general anesthetic, lose your sympathetic tone, you'll have dilation of all these venous capacitance beds. And the result of that then is a decreased central venous pressure and you'll have less filling of your heart during diastole. So to go back to the regular state, we need to re-squeeze these veins somehow in order to increase our CVP, increase the right heart filling, and increase our left ventricular preload. I'm gonna steal some thunder from my adrenergic agonist video, but you can achieve this by giving an alpha-1 agonist, which causes contraction of these smooth muscles. So there's alpha-1 receptors on these. Anytime we talk about preload, it's worth mentioning the Frank Starling curve, which shows you the stroke volume that you get for any given left ventricular end diastolic volume. With very low left ventricular end diastolic volume, you get very low stroke volume, which makes sense. And then at the other extreme, where you have high left ventricular end diastolic volume, you'll have high stroke volume. You'll notice there's this part of the curve where increasing your preload does not actually increase your stroke volume. So this flat part is your area where you're not fluid responsive. Giving this patient more fluids in order to try to bring up their preload more will not increase their blood pressure here. When you are low down on this curve, you have much stroke volume to be gained by increasing your uh, end diastolic volume. If we do some intervention to the patient here to increase their preload, like give them a bolus or even uh, do a leg raise, which will essentially give the patient a bolus of their own blood um, as increased uh, blood return to the heart, then you'll see increase stroke volume. So all of this is improved stroke volume. Therefore, we'll see some increase in the blood pressure. As you further increase your left ventricular and diastolic volume, the returns that you get for increasing stroke volume 
are much smaller. And then you get to this point of the curve where you're not fluid responsive at all. Here, increasing your preload any further does not give you any better stroke volume. So it doesn't make sense to bolus this patient anymore because even if it further stretches our myocardium at the end of diastole, we're not getting any increased stroke volume from this. This leg raise technique is actually quite useful um, for patients who have hypotension following induction of anesthetic or a spinal because these people will be low down on the Frank Starling curve with low preload and then you increase the blood return to the heart so you have a higher preload and increase their stroke volume. So this could be a bolus, leg raise, an alpha-1 agonist to squeeze these venous capacitance beds and increase the blood return to the heart. There are lots of factors that affect preload. We've talked about sympathetic tone or uh, vascular tone mediated by alpha-1 receptors. Heart rate and rhythm will affect the amount of time that you spend in diastole. You need more time in diastole to adequately fill the left ventricle. So tachycardia will lower your preload and Brady will increase your preload. And then any arrhythmia will also affect the normal filling patterns of the left ventricle. Tachycardia is very bad for uh, preload and your heart actually knows this. There's this built-in reflex called the bezel gerish reflex. This causes a vagal response when very low preload is detected. This is an attempt to allow more time for ventricular filling. Um, unfortunately, the end result of this tends to just be that you have even worse cardiac output because now you have a slow heart rate on top of also uh, still relatively low preload. In any case, this reflex does exist and it tries to slow your heart rate down so that you'll get more uh, preload. Diastolic dysfunction uh, decreases your preload. If you have a stiff ventricle or high left ventricular end diastolic pressures, um, that will all mean that you have less filling because it's harder to fill a chamber that has high pressure in it. Your overall volume status is important for preload. As we've shown, uh, giving someone a bolus who is in a low preload state may increase their stroke volume by increasing their left ventricular and diastolic volume. And for breathing, if you're breathing in or out and with regular uh, breathing or positive pressure ventilation. Every shock state except for cardiogenic shock involves uh, low preload to some degree which means that if you have distributive or hypovolemic or obstructive shock, it always makes sense to give more fluid until you've reached this not fluid responsive phase of your Frank Starling curve. Just avoid giving fluids when they're not providing any additional benefit because then you're risking uh, putting the patient into heart failure by overloading them. Lastly, um, let's talk about SVR, your systemic vascular resistance. Just uh, notice that the blood pressure is the product of your cardiac output times the SVR, and your systemic vascular resistance basically is the same thing as your afterload is also a determinant of your stroke volume. So by having a higher afterload, you'll have a slightly lower stroke volume and the overall resistance here to the flow of your cardiac output is what determines your blood pressure. So SVR, i.e. afterload. Technically, afterload is specifically referring to the ventricular wall stress. And you'll see this come up, uh, just the pressure times the radius divided by 2H this is usually mentioned in relation to the concentric remodeling that you get when you have high afterload. But we'll draw the myocardium here. And H is the thickness of the myocardium. Radius is the entire radius, including myocardium and the uh, space in the ventricle. 
and P is the pressure inside the ventricle. This tells us that the stress on this myocardium is proportional to increases in pressure and increases in radius, um, but you can reduce the stress on the wall by increasing the thickness of the myocardium. So that's why you get concentric remodeling of the heart when you have high afterload. You have thickening of this myocardium in order to increase the myocardial width and decrease the wall stress. Anyways, this afterload or resistance to ejecting blood from the left ventricle comes from two things. First being the viscoelastic properties of the aorta and its proximal branches. And this is constant. Unless something unusual happens like an aortic dissection, these properties tend to remain the same. Um, so the main determinant of your SVR then, the thing that changes is your arterial tone or your arteriolar tone. The smooth muscles in your arterioles have the ability to contract and change your radius. So this is a relaxed state where we have a large radius or we could have a contracted bunch of smooth muscles in this arteriole and get a very small radius. The reason this is so effective is that resistance is proportional to one over radius to the fourth power. Or you could say that your flow is proportional to the radius of something to the fourth power. If you constrict this arterial um, and decrease the radius by a factor of two, or cut the radius in half, you'll increase the resistance by a factor of 16. There are alpha one receptors on the smooth muscle in the arteries, which allow your blood pressure to be regulated. Just realized my alpha symbol here is looking a lot like these proportional two symbols. Don't get confused, this is alpha one receptors. You could technically calculate SVR if you had invasive monitors. Um, you just need to have your map, uh, know your CVP, and importantly, your cardiac output, which you would basically be getting from a right heart cath. So your mean arterial pressure minus your CVP over your cardiac output is equal to your systemic vascular resistance. There's this times 80 in here, which is just a unit conversion. The reason you subtract your CVP is because you're interested in the systemic vascular resistance. So all of the resistance that causes increased blood pressure in this system um, and not the fact that there's 10 millimeters of mercury of pressure pushing back from your central venous system. Then this is just a regular uh, resistance equals pressure divided by flow equation. There are a number of factors that affect SVR. Um, sympathetic nervous system tone is what uh, regulates your SVR usually, and that's by your alpha-1 receptors on the smooth muscle. Your vasopressor class of medications increases your SVR again by alpha-1. There are also vasodilators. Um, nitro is commonly used, and hydralazine is a direct vasodilator as well. So these will decrease your SVR. Activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and HPA axis will increase your SVR. This is why taking medications like ACE inhibitors will decrease your blood pressure. Hypothermia increases your SVR. Patients with cirrhosis will have low systemic vascular resistance. And alkalosis increases SVR. I think we'll keep it simple and we'll stop there. Um, just want to clarify that increasing your SVR will cause an increase in your blood pressure, but likely at the expense of decreased stroke volume, which would translate into overall lower cardiac output because your cardiac output is equal to your stroke volume times your heart rate. So as much as we need to maintain a certain blood pressure to ensure perfusion to organs, we need to be careful about raising the SVR so high 
that our cardiac output decreases and the amount of blood that gets to those organs is very low. The only other thing I'll say is just be careful um, describing the systemic vascular resistance as afterload because technically the afterload of the RV is, I should say from, the pulmonary vascular resistance because the RV pumps against the vascular resistance of your lungs. So the stress on your left ventricle um, during systole is determined by your systemic vascular resistance and the stress on your right ventricle during systole is determined by your pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, I'll just leave these factors affecting pulmonary vascular resistance here for you to go over, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about these. Maybe one day I'll have time to make a video about the right heart, but uh, not right now. <laughs>